Hi everyone, thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living is very excited to host this webinar with Brighter Bites and Catch Global Foundation. Um, we look forward to hearing on the evolution of Brighter Bites. Um, just some housekeeping. If you do have any questions, um, please type them into the control panel question chat box. We will have um, a 15 minute Q&A session at the end of this webinar. And if you have anything that comes up or have any questions, please contact me, Veronica Rodriguez. And that's at veronicarodriguez.1 at uth.tmc.edu. I'll let more of the attendees roll in for a second. So now I'd like to introduce Duncan from Catch Global Foundation, who will introduce our Brighter Bites speakers for this webinar. Great. Thank you so much, Veronica, and thank you all for using part of your day to hear this webinar. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing it myself. Uh, we at Catch Global Foundation have been uh, very, very flattered and pleased to work with Brighter Bites since, you know, before they even started. Um, CATCH is a school health program that's used in over 10,000 schools and sites around the country. And I think one of the greatest strengths of CATCH is that it really functions as a platform or system that communities can build on top of. So we don't try to you know, dictate what the final result looks like. We try to provide the right ingredients um, uh, that are scientifically proven and help communities to build something um, that is consistent with the best practices of health and wellness that really works for them. And we work with a number of organizations as essentially part of their service offering. Uh, and, and Brighter Bites is, is really a wonderful example of that. And I think it's an extremely creative example of that. Um, it's a, it, having a, a big impact. It's having an increasing amount of, of scientific evidence surrounding it. So we're very, very pleased to be part, one of the ingredients, if you will, in, you know, in the Brighter Bites final product. So uh, without further ado, I'm looking forward to introducing our speakers. There are three people that I, that I know and admire. Uh, first is going to be Mike Pomeroy, uh, who is the Senior Program Director at Brighter Bites. Mike oversees and directs the programmatic aspects of Brighter Bites across all of their cities, including the program implementation and evaluation, community relations, and the site and volunteer recruitment and engagement. Uh, he was an integral part of the Brighter Bites rollout during its first three years, uh, where he worked closely with Dr. Sharma. Uh, before Brighter Bites, Mike lobbied for improved national school lunch standards as an intern with the Center for Science and the Public Interest, and he also worked with Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign, uh, and currently uh, has been serving on the Houston ISD SHAC School Health Advisory Committee since 2011. And importantly, Mike's favorite go food is tomatoes. That's a good one. Um, second is Dr. Srila Sharma, who's an associate professor of epidemiology and a faculty member of the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living at the UT Health School of Public Health. Uh, Dr. Sharma is a trained dietitian and physical therapist with a passion for treating preventable diseases stemming from poor lifestyles, primarily heart disease, diabetes, and hypertension. A professor of epidemiology and faculty member of the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living at the UT School of Public Health. I think I just repeated myself, sorry. Um, her, her interest is in nutrition and physical activity-based interventions to address obesity via school, family, and the community, predominantly in low-income minority populations. And she's a co-founder of Brighter Bites and also serves on the mayor of Houston's Go Healthy Houston Task, Task Force. Dr. Sharma's favorite Go food is bok choy, another good selection. And then finally, you'll be hearing from Sam Newman, uh, who's the executive director at Brighter Bites. He joined Brighter Bites in 2016 as the team's inaugural executive director after over a decade in international business and development, marketing, research, and retail. Uh, as the executive director, he oversees the entire Brighter Bites organization, which now has 43 employees and a $3.2 million annual budget, um, which they use to do programming in six cities. His primary focus is on building a strong organizational foundation and establishing a vision that promotes programmatic excellence and impact through efficient growth. That, of course, along with having a lot of fun working with kids and families and building communities of health alongside great partners. 
and 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 I agree with everything Sam said in his bio, in, including that his favorite Go food is a cold, crispy apple. That's my favorite one too. So welcome and thank you again for uh, your your work with Catch. Thank you, Duncan, for uh, the warm introduction. Um, as Duncan mentioned earlier, I'm Srila Sharma, and uh, it, it, I am honored and delighted to present uh, Brighter Bites to everyone today. Um, um, just wanted to share our mission first, which is to create communities of health through fresh food. Next slide, please. So, Brighter Bites is a nonprofit that delivers fresh fruits and vegetables directly into the hands of families while teaching them how to use it. Um, and we are going to talk about a little bit about the evolution, how Brighter Bites started, how it became a nonprofit, uh, the impact that we're seeing, and where we are going next. Next slide, please. So as we know, uh, there is a great need in regards to uh, chronic disease prevention, especially childhood obesity. Um, we had some late stats come out this um, uh, past week um, about the obesity rates among children still being very high and approximately three out of 10 children being overweight or obese, um, not to mention the fact that one of the modifiable risk factors to preventing obesity is eating a healthy diet, um, but consumption of fruits and vegetables remains low. And we also know that the consequences of um, obesity among children from a um, health perspective is high. And an obese child um, has higher healthcare costs as compared to children at a healthy weight. And at the bottom of all of this, when we think about food and how, it's, how it relates to health, uh, there is also a lack of understanding about this relationship. And so kind of, you know, setting the tone, uh, I'm using this slide to kind of set the tone for um, where uh, the evolution for Brighter Bites happened. Next slide, please. So the origins are, of Brighter Bites are very organic. Um, Lisa Helfman, who is the founder of Brighter Bites, um, participated in a weekly fruit and vegetable co-op. And uh, she is an attorney by trade and uh, was working at Texas Children's Hospital, which is one of the premier hospitals here in Houston, Texas. And um, just by participating in the co-op, she found that her children were eating healthier. And um, uh, at that time, just watching the rising healthcare costs uh, with childhood obesity at Texas Children's, she um, was wondering whether she could replicate this change that she saw in our family in underserved communities and among children and families that need it the most. So that was kind of the question that she had in her mind um, when we met about six years ago. Uh, next slide, please. So the first uh, partners that uh, Lisa engaged with were the Houston Food Bank and um, my place of work, which is the UT Health uh, School of Public Health. Um, uh, so, the food bank, uh, a little bit of background about the food bank. The Houston Food Bank is one of the largest food banks in the country and distributes over 30 million pounds of produce every year. And Brian Green, who's the president of the Houston Food Bank, is um, highly innovative and um, at that time was thinking about how do we feed families um, in a more impactful way. Um, and then um, Lisa and I met along with Dr. Christine Markham, who's another faculty member of the School of Public Health. And um, the question that was um, at, at the forefront of our discussions was how do we augment um, the interventions in regards to childhood obesity prevention by combining access and education? Um, so that's how uh, that or Brighter Bites essentially originated through these three partnerships. Next slide, please. 
So the formula for Brighter Bites, which evolved from uh, those discussions and reviewing the literature and uh, talking with the food bank was um, threefold. One is produce distribution. Uh, so sending families home for, with approximately 25 pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables um, donated through the local food bank. Second uh, is nutrition education in school using the evidence-based CATCH curriculum and at home using parent handbooks that we developed that essentially carried the CATCH messages home to the parents. And the third pillar uh, was the fun food experience, which was a recipe tasting experience for the parents when they came up to pick their weekly bags of produce in the schools. So as the kids and the parents would get to try a healthy and a tasty recipe that is tied to one of the produce items in the bag. And then our bottom line, um, which you see down here, was uh, to measure outcomes to determine if this formula was actually impactful and feasible. Next slide, please. So this is uh, this was the logic model that we developed. It's a little crowded, but uh, gives you an overview of um, our uh, logic model, and it was uh, the program was theoretically grounded in the social cognitive theory constructs. And if you see on the left side um, uh, of the slide, you see all the intervention components, which was the weekly produce and recipe card distribution, the bilingual parent handbooks, the recipe demonstrations. Um, and the teacher-led CATCH activities. And at the organizational levels, we implemented CATCH, uh, which uses a train-the-trainer model. And uh, we also had several CATCH events uh, in the school, like family fun nights. And um, uh, we, use a, we used a co-op model to implement the program. So parents uh, came in to help with the bagging and distribution of the produce. So we implemented all three components and you see the intervention targets that we wanted to influence at the organizational level, interpersonal level, and the individual level. And the goal was uh, to uh, improve parental behaviors, uh, primarily cooking um, from basic ingredients, um, uh, using nutrition labels and other facts to make influence grocery purchasing, healthy menu planning and such, and influencing the parental rules around healthy eating at home, and of course, influencing the home environment in terms of availability of fresh fruits and um, vegetables for themselves and their family. The main child outcomes that we were interested in um, uh, influencing were, of course, intake of uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, but we also were interested in looking at a substitution effect in terms of uh, um, sugar intake and sugar sweetened beverage intake as well. Next slide, please. So once we had this logic model and our intervention materials, um, we uh, did a feasibility pilot in one class in one school. So Mike Feinberg was the founder of KIPP Charter Schools. Um, they serve predominantly low-income children in um, Houston and several other cities around the country. Um, he said to us that we can pilot the program in one school. Um, and we piloted it in KIPP Explore, which was 93% uh, of the children were on the free and reduced lunch program. And it was primarily Hispanic. And we implemented the program uh, for 16 weeks in the school year, which is the um, which is what our intention uh, was. And uh, we I have the citation listed here, but essentially we found the program to be highly feasible and acceptable. And um, we found some preliminary changes in regards to their uh, dietary habits and the home nutrition environment. And so our next step then was to uh, do, take a deeper dive and use a more stringent study design to determine impact of the program. But before we get into that, next slide, please. 
I wanted to get a, sort of get, put this little teaser of where we are um, with Brighter Bites and how far we've come. And we want to share a little bit more about our formula before um, we share the impact. So since 2012, um, which is when we did the, our first pilot, Brighter Bites has provided 14 million pounds of primarily donated produce um, and over 100,000 education materials to more than 30,000 families at over 100 sites across four cities in Texas and New York. And um, the evolution of Writer Bites has been interesting. We spent the first uh, three years um, sort of tweaking the formula and proving the formula. And then in fall 2015, Writer Bites became its own nonprofit. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike Pomeroy, who's the Senior Program Director, to share a little bit more about the formula and then um, he'll turn it back to me to talk, uh, and I'll talk about the impact of the program. Mike? Thank you, Srila, and thank you all for, for joining today. We're excited to talk about this with you. <clears throat> As Srila mentioned, there's three main pillars of Brighter Bites, and they're listed here, produce distribution, nutrition education, and a fun food experience. Each three of those we, re we consider one of our pillars, and we build our program around those and make sure that each is delivered on a weekly basis to families, and that's part of the logic model that Srila described that will help those families um, experience behavior change over the long term. So we're going to go through each of these eight steps that you see uh, in a little more detail, and I'll explain some of the, the nitty-gritty about each step. So the first thing we have to do is engage communities. We work with schools. Um, as Srila mentioned, uh, we work with schools that are uh, have high percentages of a free and reduced lunch populations um, or who are designated as Title I. We do that so that it's a site level eligibility uh, and those are the, once a school is eligible, then all of the families um, who attend that school are able to participate in the program. Um, and we make sure that the schools are able to, they, they actually apply to be a Brighter Bright school and we visit each school that applies. Um, and make sure that they're able to commit to delivering the nu nutrition education component, that they have the space on their campus to be able to accommodate a program like ours, and that they have the parent volunteers able to support the program. Uh, next, we work with um, the food bank partners in our, in our various cities to source and select produce. Um, we, we have a target of of a lot of variety to send home with families. We want to send families home with items that they're familiar with, like carrots and apples and potatoes, but then we want to layer on new and exciting items that, that they might be too unfamiliar with and, and not really willing to spend their limited dollars on them in the in the store. Uh, but once we we send eggplant home, for example, with some fun recipes for kids, mom learns that she likes eggplant and that her child likes eggplant, and then she feels more empowered to use her, her produce monies for a client in the store. So that, that variety and the sourcing is really key that we have a good balance of familiar and then slowly introducing new items. Um, next, we work with the food banks to, to deliver the bulk produce directly to our schools. So the, the 40 pound boxes of squash and the 50 pound bags of uh, potatoes are loaded onto mixed pallets at the food banks that we work with. And then they're delivered in bulk straight to our school partners. Um, we, it, it's, it requires a lot of hands there at the school to, to help unload that work, that, that produce. Um, but it's really rewarding work. And next we will see some of those families. Um, on the next slide, this is a, a picture of some of our volunteers here at a school in in Houston, Texas, we engage these volunteers um, from the actual parent population at the school. Uh, it's really a great opportunity for parents to to dig into the the co-op concept here. They're they're able to participate in the in the bagging of the produce. Um, we give families T-shirts. We uh, have fun raffles and prizes for them, um, and this really has served to in increase engagement. Um, of parents in their their child's school. We've had principals and teachers telling us that they're seeing parents come in and volunteer that otherwise would have been intimidated to volunteer at their school. But volunteering with Brighter Bites doesn't require literacy, it doesn't require English language proficiency, 
it's really something that you can see the need and see the benefit. And so we've really helped increase parent engagement at these schools at the same time as, as helping them live healthier lives. Uh, we also work directly with our school partners to teach Brighter Choices right in the classroom. So as Duncan mentioned, from the very beginning, we partnered with the CATCH uh, Global Foundation and their uh, the CATCH curriculum, which has been shown to help decrease childhood obesity rates in, in schools where it's implemented. Um, and so we work with teachers to make sure they're trained in, in CATCH uh, implementation. We work closely with them throughout the year to make sure that they're actually implementing those lessons. Um, we coax and encourage teachers to make sure that they're uh, teaching the lessons to the kids. And we also s send the produce items directly to the classrooms and ask teachers to do produce activities with kids in the classroom. This, this helps the t kids see all of their different role models in their lives engaging with and interacting with these produce uh, items. Their teachers, their parents, the, the other parents at the school. Um, and this really helps to, to get them excited about eating the produce themselves. Each week when we send the bags home, we have a fun food experience, which is one of those pillars that we mentioned. We prepare a recipe ahead of time using one or more of the produce items that go home in the bags that week. Um, and bring it to the distribution. Parents have to pick up the produce. We, it's, it's too much weight to send home with a child alone, so we always require parents to come inside the school and engage with us, not only about the, the recipe of the week, but also on a healthy topic of the week. Um, we also send parents home with how-to sheets for unfamiliar produce. So going back to our eggplant example, what an eggplant is, different ways that you can cook it, uh, different ways that you that can be prepared that are, are kid friendly uh, and all of our materials are available in English and Spanish um, and then finally families take this this food home uh, empowered to use it in their own kitchens they have the nutritional materials to, to work with unfamiliar produce items um, they have their kids bugging them because they're excited about trying out that kohlrabi or the new berries that might be in the bag that week all of the resources that we make available to parents are also available online and they can access these tip sheets, a whole host of recipes. Um, they're, they're all available at our website at brighterbites.org. Um, and we also engage with them in social media. We, we have a presence on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and, and uh, try to help our parents out at home in, in creating this healthy environment. And then we repeat this uh, for eight weeks in the fall and eight weeks in the spring. This uh, re repetition really helps families build healthy habits over time. Uh, they, they get used to having an abundance of produce and get used to preparing it and, and eating that much produce, additional produce in their diets. Uh, it also, you know, we, we've, we know that children require repeated exposure to, to new foods before they're willing to give them a try. And so as we send home these new produce items week by week, um, season by season throughout the entire school year, it really creates that repeated opportunity to have children and families uh, embrace the, the healthier lifestyle and be excited about living healthy. We couldn't do any of this without the strength of many, many partners. Um, th this, this is a, a wide range of partners that have supported us. We receive much of our funding in Texas for, through USD SNAP Ed. Um, we have great partners in Cisco Fresh Point who, who have introduced us to many growers and farmers throughout the country that are generously donating to our program. Uh, of course, you see there are food bank partners. Um, we've mentioned earlier that we're in Houston, Dallas, and Austin here in Texas. We've expanded to New York, and soon we will be in with partnering with the Capital Area Food Bank in Washington, D.C., and the Harry Chapin Food Bank of Southwest Florida. Uh, we're, we couldn't do this work at all without strong partners in each of these regions, so we're looking forward to building this list as we grow. Uh, and this last list of partners, these are our actual growers who are donating produce to our families. Um, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi that I mentioned, we, we, we've learned a lot of new items ourselves from, from these generous donations. Um, and it, this really helps emphasize that this is a, a group effort of many industry, key industry players that are working together to bring about a program like this. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, this is Srila again. 
And uh, as Mike mentioned, there are many parts to the program. So just to reiterate, we have, we send families home with about 20 pounds, which is 50 servings of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and a variety of it. So each family gets about eight to 10 different kinds of produce. And we combine that with education in school and at home. And we do the fun food experience to have the kids try a healthy and a tasty recipe. And the program's implemented for 16 weeks in the school year and eight weeks uh, in the summer. And uh, so as, as I mentioned earlier, we spent the first three years just kind of um, figuring out the formula and, it, and answering the question, is it working? And since then, we've uh, also created a centralized database where um, families get, uh, once they enroll into the program, are tracked longitudinally. And we track um, uh, not just you know, program dosage, reach, fidelity, but we also monitor outcomes in terms of um, uh, dietary behaviors and the home nutrition environment. Um, next slide, please. So uh, these are some of the results that we saw in the study, two-year study that we did from 2013 to 2015. Um, it, it was uh, testing out our logic model and our formula, and we had um, uh, six, six schools that received Brighter Bites and uh, six schools that didn't. And uh, our results showed that uh, children uh, and parents who received the Brighter Bites program had uh, uh, an increased consumption of uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, the children were also reporting, uh, well, the parents reported serving more fruits and vegetables as, as snacks uh, at meals at home, and the children were con consuming less sugar as uh, compared to the children who were in schools did, who did not receive brighter bites. Next slide. Oh, one before, please. Oh, I think uh, <laughs> we're, we're slipping one slide. Uh, for some reason, but uh, we also, there it is. So we also wanted to, if you uh, remember the logic model, um, the home environment was a big target of the uh, program. And we also found that uh, uh, there were significant improvements in the home environment among families receiving Brighter Bites. Uh, we saw twofold increase in cooking meals from scratch, um, an increase in eating meals together um, at home and serving more fruits and vegetables at those meals. And we also found that parents uh, were using our uh, educational materials uh, and the nutrition uh, labels to guide their grocery purchasing decisions. So um, our, uh, we also, uh, some of the other ancillary results we saw were also improvements in the school environment uh, since school was the venue where the program was implemented. Next slide. Some of our process metrics, so, so these are uh, data collected from our ongoing um, process evaluation efforts. Um, we send a lot of produce home, and so we want to know if the families are eating or, you know, throwing <laughs> the vegetables and fruits that we're giving them. And um, uh, this uh, data shows that a majority of their families reported they're eating all or most of the food that is provided to them. Next slide. And we also uh, want to know if um, our families are able to maintain these levels when the brighter bite season ends. So 74% of our families uh, reported that they are able to maintain these increased levels of intake after the brighter bites um, season ended. And this is really interesting because um, the goal of the program is um, primarily to use these fruits and vegetables that we are giving them to create a demand for uh, healthy food in the families. And uh, our preliminary work showed that the barriers to eating fruits and vegetables 
were um, not just access, but also lack of knowledge on what to do with it. And so there was a, this whole intimidation by produce that was going on in the families where they wouldn't buy the fruits and vegetables because they uh, because of fear of uh, their children not eating it or they wouldn't know how to cook it. So if they were on a limited budget, they wouldn't feel comfortable buying the produce. So this, this was an interesting finding. And um, as Mike mentioned earlier, our pro produce is primarily donated coming through local food bank uh, type of organizations. And um, uh, we uh, wanted to ask the families um, about the weekly savings that they perceived uh, on their grocery bill. And on average, it was about $34. And what's interesting is that when we did random selection of our grocery, of the bags we are giving the families, the retail cost of those bags was about $35. So, so these families were right on the money um, with regards to their savings. Next slide. We've also done a lot of qualitative data collection over the years. and. Um, this uh, th this was a quote from one of those uh, data collections, which kind of summarizes what Brighter Bites does for our families. Uh, and it says uh, from one of our parents that Brighter Bites made me cook things I wouldn't have bought for fear of wasting money if my children didn't like it. And so by linking the school and the home, uh, Brighter Bites is able to break down those barriers um, with regards to healthy eating for these families. Next slide. So to summarize uh, the different points of impact for Brighter Bites, uh, there are several. Um, what Brighter Bites has done effectively is essentially link systems uh, that may not uh, be linked uh, before or optimize them uh, in a way that they probably haven't been optimized before. So um, by linking the food banks uh, with the schools and the schools to the home, um, Brighter Bites is able to reduce food waste by channeling produce that would otherwise be thrown away into families uh, that need it the most in a way that's purposeful and impactful because uh, we deliver the program on an ongoing basis for 16 weeks in the school year and eight weeks in the summer. And finally, uh, the program goes the last mile by actually bringing produce into the homes of these families. And so it gives them a risk-free trial to actually try these fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and by teaching families how to use it, we are improving the literacy uh, with regards to uh, breaking down the barriers attached to cooking and purchasing behaviors. Um, next slide. So this is just a pictorial uh, view of uh, how Brighter Bites functions if in essentially linking food waste to public health. Um, uh, the, the, on the left-hand side, we have the three primary avenues of food waste at the production level, the retail level, and the household level. So at the production level, we have uh, a large amount of produce that uh, at the um, farmers and the growers that is potentially thrown away because it's not retail worthy. Uh, for whatever reason, it's imperfect produce, it's not pretty, um, and so uh, the food distributors and retailers may not buy it, and a lot of it goes into the landfill. And uh, Brighter Bites is able to rescue that uh, by working with the food banks and uh, other for-profit agencies, for example, such as Cisco Foods, um, and bring it into the food banks. Uh, similarly, at the retail level, uh, aggregating produce that would be thrown away by grocery stores and bringing it into the food banks, and then channeling all of this produce to uh, families that needed the most and combining that with hands-on nutrition education using evidence-based programs such as CATCH um, and uh, parent education opportunities. So it's, it's a, 
very holistic approach of uh, channeling uh, food waste in and reducing waste at the consumer level as well, uh, and then uh, improving the diets and reducing food insecurity among uh, these families. And we are able to track this. So we are, uh, these points that you see here are points that we are able to track through our centralized uh, data system that, that we have developed. Next slide. These are just some of the publications that we have worked on and are available on the Brighter Bites um, website. Uh, and um, um, I think, next slide. Uh, I will turn it over to Sam to discuss uh, where we are going next. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks, Sharila, and thanks everyone for, for listening in. Um, we'll get to Q&A here in a sec, but I get kind of the fun part of talking about where we're going now that you've seen one of where we've come from and the impact that we're making. So you know that six school years ago, we started in one KIPP school here in Houston serving about 150 families. Well, over time, since then, we've grown to about 116 sites, which is what we'll be in this school year and next summer, and we'll serve over 20,000 individual families. And that's growing from Houston to Dallas to Austin, now New York, soon to be DC, and after that, Southwest Florida. Um, and we've also been able to grow into different arenas. For example, we did a very successful project with MD Anderson, where we, um, where we launched Brighter Bites in a faith-based setting to uh, a lot of success. And so as we've grown, we've not only grown in the number of families we're serving, we've also gotten better at, um, uh, we've also gotten more varied in terms of the venues uh, where we're operating. And so serving 20,000 families a year takes, takes a ton of produce. And I wanted to illustrate here just how varied our bags can be on a weekend and week out basis because our goal of course is to have about eight to 12 different kinds of fruits and vegetables in the bag and in so doing we really work hard with our food bank partners and uh, other sourcing partners to try to make it as colorful and exciting as it can be to keep families coming back week in and week out now if you look at this grid you'll see some things that you probably know and maybe a couple of things that you don't know i'll be the first to cop to the fact that I, I still am not entirely sure what to do with, with kohlrabi. Um, but here it is, and we're able to keep the bags very interesting um, by going after all this variety. And what this does is this kind of keeps us tethered to our CSA roots, uh, pardon the pun. But Lisa Helfman, who started this program and conceived of it, really conceived of it through the CSA, because each week she and her family would get some items they know and some items they don't know. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here. We're trying to give some familiar items and some more adventurous items. It's gonna force the family to really think about what do we do with, um, for example, this bok choy. And we've heard anecdotally that folks that um, had never seen it now crave it. And, um, and that's kind of the, the whole point. It really drives a, a fun conversation uh, with our families about what do you do with this wonderful stuff that's in the bag and it keeps us uh, kind of at the at the vanguard of where do we need to develop more of our educational materials for example uh, we had heard at one point we were giving away a lot of mushrooms and families did not know entirely what to do with, with these mushrooms and so we were able to develop pretty quickly a tip sheet and some recipes and blow that out over dozens and dozens of different items and you can see where we are able to from kind of a first-hand basis uh, get our families to help us drive our content. We also think that because of the education that comes with the access to produce, we can be a very good outlet for food banks to get rid of some of their more esoteric items that might not otherwise have a home. So we're able to, if there's a big donation of spaghetti squash, for example, and maybe the local pantries don't want it because they don't think they can move it, there's no outlet for it, we know we can take it and we can make it really exciting and a lot of fun. So with all this work, all this hard work, um, it's always nice to get recognized. And I believe our Director of Marketing Communication, Stephanie Cousins is on this call. Um, and this is really a tip of the hat just to some of the publications 
that have recognized the work that we're doing and have really brought a unique perspective on the impact that we're making with the communities that we serve. And so, uh, for example, we've had some terrific articles in Texas Press, Dallas Morning News, Houston Chronicle, the Austin American Statesman. The House Committee on Agriculture released a report on SNAP-Ed uh, late last year where Dr. Sharma had actually testified before the Committee on Agriculture last summer, and her testimony informed um, a, a, a mention about brighter bites and the impact that we're making. So these are but some, uh, but some of the, um, but some of the examples. And of course, here front and center is the 2016 recognition as the Texas Health Champion uh, by the Michael and Susan Dell Center. So that was a that was a real honor. And so through the work that we're doing, and the voice that is amplified through not only what we can control through our channels, our social channels. Um, and talking directly to those who benefit, um, we also recognize the the impact that branding and marketing has on on the way we're perceived. And something that we've always been keen to impress upon all of our stakeholders is this notion of an exciting program that is truly focused on us all having fun and gathering around that which really unites us all, which is good food. And so, you know, looking at, for example, our bags, our T-shirts, our website, the presentations that we give, we've just released a video, um, which I'll direct you all to our website here uh, after this to, to watch it. But you'll see a consistency in branding and messaging that relates to good health, um, that relates to just an enjoyment of food and a true sense of community. And that is that is our mantra. And we, we believe in that day in and day out. It's really what kicks us out of bed in the morning and that manifests itself through the way we speak to our stakeholders. And those stakeholders are varied, whether it's partners such as our friends at Catch, um, whether it's uh, those who we serve, the communities where we operate, um, funders, policymakers, our employees, future employees, but we always have a consistency of voice and we really think that 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 emanates from our from our feelings of the work that we're doing. So speaking of our employees, you can see here just a quick org chart, um, and I won't go through this too much, but you can see that we've we've really built out both a programmatic side as well as an administrative side when it comes to getting this work done. And the number of dots that fall below the cities is indicative of how big we are in each of those cities. For example, in D.C. and New York, we'll have two schools. In Houston, we have over 50. In Dallas, we're at 15. And in Austin, we're at six this school year. And we're always looking uh, looking to grow, but looking to grow intelligently. And that's something I'll speak to in a minute. I wanted to note quickly our, our board, um, which, is, which is varied in terms of background and expertise, but everyone is really playing an incredible role up to and, and including, of course, our, our founder, Lisa Helpman, and Dr. Sharma, our co-founder, who are integral in the day-to-day -day, um, kind of guiding of, of this ship uh, and go down the line and you can see the impact that Cisco is having. You'll see another few, a few uh, organizations that you all probably know quite well um, between HEB, between Compass. We have really tried to uh, increase um, our, our board membership in a way that is going to drive the impact um, and drive the strategy of, of Brighter Bites. Because in the past six years, ever since Lisa had this gem of an idea and, and took it to Dr. Sharma to operationalize, and it's just grown, we've we've proven that we can get this food into the hands and homes of those who will benefit and truly make an impact. We're seeing through Dr. Sharma's research uh, that we have verified consistency in all of our cities. It's three in Texas, one in New York. Because of success, begetting success, we'll launch soon in D.C. and Southwest Florida and in all of our cities where we are and in cities where we aren't, there is uh, there is a waiting list, which makes it which makes it difficult. One never likes to say no to anything, but you have to be you know, we really have to be mindful of, of the world where we live and the resources, uh, the resource limitations that we encounter. But with each obstacle, we do try to work with all of our partners to overcome them 
in order to ultimately fulfill our mission uh, to create uh, more of a community around health. So coming into 2017, our board, uh, our board mandated the team to expand into new cities, three new cities, which we will do. Come December 31st, I'll, I'll be able to look back at 2017 and say that we have expanded and we have learned a lot along the way. We've learned a lot of what we do well and we've learned some things that we could do better. Um, but we're really looking forward to 2018 as we consider what a fast and effective national expansion looks like. And in the process of doing that, we'll work with, uh, we'll work on a, on a kind of a strategic expansion uh, project that's going to help us find where are the best cities and what are the best model or models by which to grow. And so when we consider what a good city looks like or what a good partner looks like, we look at things that range from, is there a large market into which we can grow? And of course, the sad fact remains that there is no shortage of consumers for what we're offering. Uh, hopefully we're driving ourselves out of business and getting everyone healthy, but for now, but for now we, um, we know that there's no shortage of that. We're also looking at, is there a strong logistics framework? Are there a good food bank, a good procurement partner? We're looking at just broad stroke systems in place. Is there a good evaluation uh, partner that we, can, that we can work with? What's the political climate? So we kind of evaluate a number of metrics to see where we want to grow. Um, at the end of the day though, of course, there is some urgency to this because our goal is nothing short of building a national movement around food, around fresh food, and um, and building good health. And so with that, I'll thank you for your time. And um, there's a URL down here at the bottom that I'd love for you all to, to click on. And you can see a video that we've created. Uh, this is really directed a lot towards our school partners and our families. Uh, if you go to the main page, you can see our, our longer video. Um, but I'll stop it there and uh, I believe this is where we'll do some Q&A. Thank um, This is Srila. So, uh, thanks, Sam. Um, I see a few questions uh, here on the question, and maybe the three of us can uh, take a turn turns and answering those. Um, uh, Mike, yeah, do you perfect. want to take the first question? Sure. Is that the, I see a question Thanks. from uh, Anne Messberger Agia. Uh, she asked, how was outcome data gathered via surveys, observation in the home focus groups? Um, Dr. Sharma, you and I worked on that uh, Quite a bit. We we administer parent surveys to to families three times during the school year. Uh, and that's a paper survey that we ask them to fill out. Um, but that's also supplemented with a lot of uh, other work that Dr. Sharma does with her team at, at University of Texas. That includes focus groups, uh, as well as uh, data that we gather as a team as we go throughout the year of of how we're doing. Like exactly what did we send home in in the bags this this week with this yeah. family. So yes, so we essentially uh, monitor at each site um, using site coordinator surveys. We weigh the food that is being sent home. Um, so we weigh each food item. Um, and so, so we are sending a standardized amount home uh, each week at each site. Um, and so we do that uh, across all our sites and we've developed all the standardized protocols uh, so that we're doing it consistently across uh, all our sites, and we've have we published some uh, papers uh, that discuss these the qualitative and the quantitative measures that that we're using, and then we triangulate it on the back end uh, through our data system. Thanks, Srila. There's another question from. David Ross uh, and about the school fuel program. I think that's similar to uh, to the Backpack Buddy program that we have here in Houston, where food is sent home with with children over the weekend, so that they're ensured to have uh, three healthy meals on the days when they're not attending school. 
we do get compared to that program a lot. What's different is that that we supply food. We're, we're not supplying the whole meal. We're only supplementing the fruits and vegetables of the meal. And we supply it for the entire week for the whole family, not just for the student. So we send it home with the whole family and it's meant to add two extra servings of fruits and vegetables a day to each meet, each day during the, the week. So it's similar to that program, but there's some key differences as well. Sam, we have a question here from Susie about uh, replicating Brighter Bites at other types of uh, community organizations. Would you like to take that? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks, Susie, for the question. Um, so we, we are operating in the school year predominantly in schools. Um, that to be said, I'd, I'd mentioned the faith-based organization where we launched and we had a lot of success. In the summer, when school is out of session, of course, we still want to be uh, present in the communities where we operate. And so um, our overall number of families served is going to dip a little bit, but we do operate in boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, um, and neighborhood centers. And so, uh, so absolutely, we're, we're open to any setting where children are. Um, it just so happens that schools primarily are where, are where they are and they are on a consistent basis. But ultimately our goal is to reach children and by extension families and to do it in a way that removes a few obstacles from the families having to go to another place to engage in our program. And I think you had a follow-up question um, about whether we engage all the grades we we start that is certainly our our intention sometimes we will launch with just a couple of grades to get ourselves used to the school and 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 equally important to get the school used to brighter bites it requires a lot of effort to put on our program and this is really the 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 um the uh important factor here is is around the co-op model whenever whenever we're operating in a school we'll have two paid staff members at the school, but we require a lot of volunteer effort from community members, from moms and dads of kids at the school, and of our school champions and administrators and teachers them themselves. And we get a we get a lot of help in that respect. But it does there is a bit of a learning curve. So um, sometimes with new schools, we'll launch with a few grades, and then we'll grow from there. But Optimally, we want to launch with and we want to be out operating in every grade. And I also want to add to Sam's comment about the settings and say we are also operating in Head Start programs um, as well. Head Starts are a great um, implementation partner because they have a mandate for nutrition education and also uh, an engaged uh, cohort of parents and children. Um, and also because they are, uh, uh, they serve uh, a low-income population. So um, we are absolutely in Head Start programs as well. Thank you, Srila. That uh, and I saw there was another follow-up from Susie about secondary schools. We we mostly focus on the younger kids on Head Starts and elementary schools, um, primarily because that's where the most most bang for our buck is the, the children are most likely to be willing to try new things. They're, they're still developing their palates while they're young and families are still very engaged with their kids. So we mostly are not in secondary schools. It's a primarily elementary and Head Start programs. Um, Dr. Sharma, there's another question here about uh, the evaluation that perhaps you could take. Uh, it says, what was the time frame between the end of program and evaluation regarding sustainability over time? It was in the following school year that we evaluated uh, the sustainability of the program effects. So I think um, some of our next steps, uh, with which we're trying to, um, we've applied for some funding for, is um, looking at longer term sustainability. So uh, at that point, uh, you know, given the constraints of the time frame and the funding, uh, we were only able to evaluate sustainability uh, until the following school year, which we, um, which is what we um, shared with everybody today. But hopefully we are able to um, go back and look at uh, longer term sustainability as well. 
Awesome, thanks. We have a question about uh, how we define a, a phrase that we've been using a lot, the co-op model. Um, this is kind of going back to the experience that our founder, Lisa Helfman, had in her home when she was participating in a fruit and vegetable co-op, um, which the co-op model that we're basing that on is, is one in which families take part in the neighborhood uh, garden, the different families in the neighborhood help till the garden, plant the garden, and then everybody after working together on that garden is able to take home a share of the produce that is that is created from that garden. So we're kind of going off of that model of everyone in the school environment contributes to the Brighter Bites program. Um, and this is the co-op model that then everybody in the school is able to take bags home, including teachers and administrators and all of the families uh, as, as we get their engagement through their volunteer work at the school, as well as their engagement of, of filling out our surveys for us and parking their car and coming inside to engage with us on this nutrition topic. Um, it's a little bit of asking for, for all parties to give a little in order to get a lot. And just to add to that, uh, Mike, the co-op model was um, very purposeful when we were developing our logic model because one of the challenges of um, that we saw in the literature and other interventions was engaging parents. And when we spoke with the, the food bank and the schools, um, we, uh, we identified this as an opportunity to bring parents in and um, some of the, over the years, some of the anecdotes we've heard, uh, we had one school in Houston who did not have a PTO and um, because of Writer Bites, uh, they had, a, a, they started having a PTO because the parents started coming into the schools more. Um, another anecdote we had from um, a school was uh, that parents felt that uh, they did not need to know a, a skill or a language to come into their child's school and volunteer uh, and uh, they because all they were involved in was bagging and distribution of produce and they felt like they were part of a, a community and uh, so uh, it allowed parents to engage in the school in a way that they didn't before and so there were sort of these side effects with the co-op model that uh, that we we uh, had over the years, and we collect data on average um, uh, to see on average how many parents volunteer each week at each of our sites, and on average we have between four to um, a ten uh, volunteers per school. Um, and each school serves on average between 100 to, you know, our larger schools have been about 600 families participating. So uh, these parents work with our site coordinators each week to help with this bagging and distribution. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I, I didn't see other questions here. Um, if there are not other final questions, I think we can wrap it up. We really appreciate your attention and do encourage you to go to brighterbytes.org slash participate to see the, the video that, that has been oft mentioned today. Also, Thank if you, you have any follow-up questions at all, uh, feel free to email any of the three of us. Uh, you can also just email info, I-N-F-O, at brighterbytes.org. That happens to go straight to me, so I'll distribute it to the to whoever needs to get the question, if, if you have other questions that we haven't addressed. All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks, bye.